According to Promise by Charles Spurgeon, Section 6 The Parting Nevertheless, what saith the Scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. Galatians chapter 4, verse 30 Isaac and Ishmael lived together for a time. The self-religionist and the believer in the promise may be members of the same church for years, but they are not agreed and cannot be happy together, for their principles are essentially opposed. As the believer grows in grace and enters upon his spiritual manhood, he will be more and more disagreeable to the legalist, and it will ultimately be seen that the two have no fellowship with one another. They must separate. And this is the word that will be fulfilled to the Ishmaelite. Cast out this bondwoman and her son, for the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, even with Isaac. Grievous as the parting may be, it will be according to the divine will and according to the necessities of the case. Oil and water will not mingle. Neither will the natural man's religion agree with that which is born of the promise and sustained by the promise. Their parting will be only the outward result of a serious difference which always existed. Ishmael was sent away, but he soon ceased to regret it, for he found greater freedom with the wild tribes of the country, among whom he soon became a great man. He prospered much, and became the father of princes. He was in his proper theater in the wide world. There he had honor and gained a name among its great ones. Often it happens that the carnally religious man has many excellent habits and ways about him, and having a desire to shine, he goes into society, and is appreciated and becomes notable. The world is sure to love its own. The aspiring religionist usually forsakes his first friends and openly declares, I have given up the old-fashioned style of religion. The saints were all very well while I was poor, but now I have made a fortune I feel that I must mix with a more fashionable set of people. He does so and has his reward. Ishmael had his portion in his life and never expressed a desire to share in the heavenly covenant and its mysterious blessings. If my reader would feel freer and more at home in society than the Church of God, let him know assuredly that he belongs to the world, and let him not deceive himself. As his heart is, such is he. No measure of force work can turn Ishmael into Isaac, or a whirling into an heir of heaven. Outwardly, and in this present life, the heir of the promise did not appear to have the best of it. Nor indeed should this be expected, since they who choose their heritage in the future have, in fact, agreed to accept trial in the present. Isaac experienced certain afflictions which Ishmael never knew. He was mocked, and he was at last laid on the altar. But nothing of the sort happened to Ishmael. You, who, like Isaac, are the children of the promise, must not envy those who are the heirs of this present life though their lot seems easier than your own. Your temptation is to do so, even as the psalmist did when he was grieved because of the prophecy of the wicked. There is in this fretting a measure of running back from our spiritual choice. Have we not agreed to take our part in the future rather than in the present? Do we rue the bargain? Moreover, how absurd it is to envy those who are themselves so much to be pitied, to lose the promise is practically to lose everything, and the self-righteous have lost it. These worldly professors have no spiritual light or life, and they desire none. What a loss, to be in the dark and not to know it. They have enough religion to make them respectable among men and comfortable in their own consciences. But this is a sorry gain if they are abominable in the sight of God. They feel no inward fightings and wrestlings. They find no contention of the old man against the new. And so they go through life with a jaunty air, knowing nothing till their end come. What wretchedness to be so besotted! Again I say, do not envy them. Better far is the life of Isaac 
with its sacrifice than that of Ishmael with its sovereignty and wild freedom. For all the world things greatness will soon be ended and leave nothing behind it but that which will make the eternal world to be more miserable. Yet dream not that believers are unhappy. If in this life only we had hope, we would be miserable indeed. But the promise lights up our whole career and makes us truly blessed. God's smile beheld by faith gives us fullness of joy. Put the believer's life at the greatest possible disadvantage. Paint it in the darkest colors. Take away from it not only comforts but necessities. And even then the Christian at his worst is better than the worldling at his best. Let Ishmael have the whole world. Aye. Give him as many worlds as there are stars in the midnight sky. And we will not envy him. It is ours still to take up our cross and to be strangers and foreigners with God in this land as all our fathers were. For the promise, though it seems far off to others, we do by faith realize and embrace, and in it we find a heaven below. Abiding with God and with His people, we count our lot far better than that of the greatest and most honored of the children of this world. The prospect of our Lord's second coming and of our own eternal glory in fellowship with Him, suffices to fill us with content while we wait for His appearing. This difference on earth will lead to a sad division in death. The child of the bondwoman must be cast out in eternity as well as in time. None can enter heaven who claim it by their own doings or boast that they have won it by their own strength. Glory is reserved for those who are saved by grace, and none who trust in self can enter there. What a terrible thing it will be when those who labored to establish their own righteousness and would not submit to the righteousness of Christ shall be driven out. How will they then envy those lowly ones who were fain to accept pardon through the blood of Jesus? How will they discover their folly and wickedness in having despised the gift of God by preferring their own righteousness to that of the Son of God. As the persons who are represented by Ishmael and Isaac are ultimately parted, so the principles upon which they rest must never be mingled, for they can by no means be made to agree. We cannot be saved in part by self, and in part by the promise of God. The principle and notion of earning salvation must be expelled from the mind. Every degree and form of it must be cast out. If we are so unwise as to place our dependence partly on grace and partly on merit, we shall be resting one foot on a rock and the other on the sea, and our fall will be certain. There can be no dividing of the work or of the glory of salvation. It must be all of grace or all of works, all of God or all of man, but it cannot be half of one and half of the other. Cease from the vain attempt to unite two principles, which are as adverse as fire and water. The promise, and the promise alone, must be the foundation of our hope, and all legal notions must be sternly dismissed as irreconcilable with salvation by grace. We must not begin in the spirit and hope to be made perfect in the flesh. Our religion must be all of a piece. To sow with mingled seed or to wear a garment of linen and woolen mixed was forbidden to the Lord's ancient people. And to us it is unlawful to mingle mercy and merit, grace and debt. Whenever the notion of salvation by merit or feeling or ceremonies comes in, we must cast it out without delay. Though it be as dear to us as Ishmael was to Abraham, faith is not sight, the spirit is not the flesh, grace is not merit, and we must never forget the distinction, lest we fall into grievous error and miss the heritage which belongs only to the errors according to promise. Here is our confession of faith knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, 
that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Galatians chapter 2, verse 16. Here also is the clear line of distinction as to the method of our salvation, and we desire to keep it plain and manifest. Even so, then at this present time also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. Romans chapter 11, verses 5 and 6. Reader, do you see this? End of section 6.